morning, everybody. My name is Freya Thomas and I'm an urban forester in the urban forest and ecology team at the City of Melbourne. And I'm going to be facilitating our first session. So I am about to kick us off. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the welcome, Uncle Dave and Councillor Olivia Ball. Um, and yeah, welcome everyone from us. So now our sp first speaker today, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce um, Professor Lenore Farig. She is the Chancellor's Professor of Biology at Carleton University in Canada. And her work has really focused on how landscape structure influences the abundance, distribution and persistence of organisms in the landscape. Yeah. Um, I've been reading through a lot of Lenore's papers recently and I, there was one summary that said she has recently sparked a lively debate in the literature um, about habitat fragmentation and the loss of biodiversity, bringing some new ideas into this discussion. Uh, and so today she's going to be talking to, to us about uh, the value of small patches of vegetation. Now, she is beaming into us from Canada, so a, a very big thank you for this effort. Um, and we will get Lenore up on the screen for the first plenary talk. So we're busting urban myth number one here that small habitat patches don't matter. Okay, well, thank you very much for this invitation. Um, this uh, conference sounds really amazing, what you're doing. I wish I were there, but... Um, it would not, my, my presence would certainly not be worth the carbon emissions that it would take to, for me to get there. So, um, so I just have to do this remotely. Um, my my uh, talk is going to be about, um, I guess, busting this urban myth number one, that small habitat patches don't matter. What I'm going to do is uh, the first part of the talk will be um, generally about, about the value of small patches. Um, and and then towards the end of the talk, I will talk specifically about small patches in urban environments. Okay, so the this myth, I guess, um, goes back as far as Jared Diamond in uh, 1975, who proposed that a single large patch or even a few large ones should have higher biodiversity then several small patches of habitat, natural habitat, um, totaling the same area. So this is actually a um, the figure from his paper. And on the left, so this is a piece of the figure. So, so situation B here compares a single large circular patch to four small circular patches. So SL stands for single large and SS stands for several small. And he's proposing that the single large patch is better, meaning there should be higher biodiversity and the several small patches are worse. Um, so this, this was really a hypothesis on the part of Jared Diamond, but it became um, essentially dogma almost right away. So in 1980, um, the IUCN reprinted that figure, this, this is from the, uh, the World Conservation Strategy, the figure um, that was reprinted from Diamond's paper. And um, this World Conservation Strategy is actually was a document that was very influential. It was meant to direct countries in how they could best conserve their nature. So it went from a hypothesis to uh, dogma within um, influential conservation document quite quickly. And it's still present in policies all over the place, um, all over the world, um, not explicitly as single large versus several small, but um, it is present in policies that, um, that uh, offer protection for uh, habitat, but only for habitat in patches that are larger than some minimum size. And there, you can find those kinds of criteria um, all over the world still. Um, we know that um, this is this is uh, uh, a figure from a paper by uh, Federico Riva and myself. Uh, Federico was a former po uh, postdoc in my lab. And what he did was he uh, looked globally at uh, the loss of forest from patches um, between 1992 and 2000. 
And he, so he compared for a given uh, um, size of uh, amount of forest to be lost, so a plot of forest lost, um, was it more likely to be lost in that 30 year period if it had started out in a small patch or if it had started out in a large patch? And quite consistently, he found that habitat, a given area of habitat or forest, is more likely to be lost from small patches than from large patches. So this may be partly driven by this um, assumption that small habitats on a per area basis have low biodiversity value. So is this all fine? Is this okay? Was diamond right? Are there more species in a single large patch or several small patches? So um, people actually start, researchers start to actually test this idea uh, fairly quickly after diamond proposed it. And the way that this is done is you have a, a set of patches that which are represented by these green rectangles. And you know the list of species that occur, let's say the bird species that occur in each of the patches. And then you can make subsets of patches um, which have the same total area, but uh, where you might have uh, one large patch, three um, large-ish patches and many small patches. Um, so now you have uh, you have the same total area and you can add up the species lists for those subsets. And so this people started to do this. And what they um, actually found was the opposite of what Diamond said. So this is a review of those studies, the first review of those studies, which was in uh, 1982 by Simberloff and Abiel. And they found no cases where there were more species in one large uh, site than several small ones, and many cases where there were more species in several small patches than in a single uh, large one. And a few years later, uh, Quinn and Harrison did another review of the literature and found that in all cases where there was an effect of subdivision um, or fragmentation, um, the more subdivided collection of islands or isolates contained more species. So again, for the same total amount of habitat. Quinn and Harrison also introduced a, a useful way to um, visually do this evaluation, um, which uh, uh, I, I'm actually, I've actually called the Quinn and Harrison uh, sloss, sloss curves. Um, so I'm going to describe those quickly because I'm going to come back to a couple of examples later in the talk. So the curve is like this. You have so you have your set of patches where you know the species that are present in each patch. And then you're going to make a curve where actually two curves, but where you accumulate, you add patches together, accumulating their area on the uh, x-axis and on the y-axis, you add those same patches together, accumulating the, the total number of species. Um, and so uh, in, you can accumulate these patches in either from the smallest to the largest patch or from the largest to the smallest patch. So here's a hypothetical curve from the smallest to the largest patch. So this is the smallest patch, the second smallest, I hope you can see my pointer, um, the third smallest and so on. Um, and you were accumulating the area of the patches and the number of, total number of species in the patches. And then you can do it the other way around. So you start with the number of species in the largest patch and the area of the largest patch. And then you add the second largest patch, the third largest patch, et cetera. And if the curves look like this, oh, um, and then this just shows that um, uh, for a given area, uh, cumulative area, you can then compare whether you have more species in several small, that would be the purple line here. So you've got one, two, three, four, five patches and uh, or single large here, you've got one, one large patch, the same total area of habitat. And if the curves look like these two curves, then you have more species in several small than few large patches. So if the small to large curve is entirely above the large to small curve, then for a given total area of habitat, there are more species in several small than few large patches. If the opposite is true, the large to small curve is entirely above the small to large curve, then for a given total area of habitat, there are more species in few large than several small patches. And if the curves are on top of each other or crossing each other, then there is essentially no difference between the number of species in several small patches than in few large patches. So then going back to the reviews, uh, a couple of years ago, I did another update on these 
uh, studies. Um, and uh, what I found was consistent with what both um, Simberloff and Abiel and also Quinn and Harrison found, which was a preponderance of results showing more species in several small patches than in few large patches. So there were about five times as many studies showing more species in several small patches than in few large patches. And uh, these studies that, that were included in this review spanned a wide range of di different taxonomic groups. So mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, uh, plants, and various kinds of um, invertebrates. So it's, it's not just a single group of species that this um, result is uh, holding for. So you might wonder why, why are there more species in several small than few large patches? Um, well, this is an exciting uh, area of research, which you can tell by the colorful text. Um, I'm, I'm not actually going to go into detail about all these um, hypotheses and potential reasons for why there are more species in several small patches than few large, just to say that there are lots of potential reasons. And, um, and if you have questions about them afterwards, then I can I can certainly answer them. Uh, but I I just uh, need to, I've got 20 minutes here, so I need to move on. So I do want to uh, remind you though, that uh, habitat amount uh, or habitat loss is the most uh, important driver of species declines, biodiversity declines. Um, and it is, uh, more important than uh, the sizes of the patches. So for example, if you have uh, this dashed line represents a landscape of a given size, if you have one small patch in the landscape um, versus another landscape of the same size, and you've got a large one large patch in that landscape, you will have more species um, existing in that one large patch than in the one small patch. But what the um, SLOS results <clears throat> Uh, indicate is that if you take that same total area and you have it and it's distributed in many small patches, you have at least as many species, often more species, um, in those several small patches than in that single large patch. So the sort of general take home from all this is that to maintain or increase biodiversity, we should have policies that support local efforts to maintain natural habitats no matter how small the individual pieces are. And I think this is particularly important in human dominated regions um, like Southern um, Canada and the, the, I believe the area of Australia that you are in, uh, where a lot of the land has been converted from natural habitat to often agricultural um, uses and also of course, urban uses and uh, the, the positive side of all that is that there are people who care about the natural habitats that exist in these areas. And so we should, uh, we should be supporting their efforts to protect those areas. And we should um, be supporting those efforts, no matter how small that um, bit of, of natural habitat is. <clears throat> and just to come back to these um, minimum patch size criteria, um, this is an analysis, again, done by Federico Riva, who compared the sizes of the patches in all the various studies that have been done to typical minimum patch size criteria. So this is the typical minimum size of a patch that qualifies for uh, protection in various different policy documents around the world. And a, a typical number for that would be uh, a, a hundred hectares would be, a, would be um, a minimum. Even a lot of them are even larger than that, a thousand hectares. And these, the small patches in these studies are smaller than uh, those, are almost all smaller than those minimum patch size uh, criteria, which means that those criteria actually do a disservice to biodiversity conservation. Okay, so uh, moving on to cities. So the first thing that I uh, did here was just look back at the review, my review of the SLAW studies to see, well, how many of the papers in there were actually done in cities and what were the results? So there are four papers uh, in that review that were done in cities and I'm gonna go through them, uh, them each, but they all show, just to spoil the surprise, they all show uh, more, higher biodiversity in many small 
patches or green spaces, whatever the natural areas are in cities, uh, than in a few large ones. So here's the first one. These are but this is a study of butterflies in urban parks in Marseille, France. And um, well, so they found, so this is one of those uh, Quinn Harrison curves. So the top curve, you're going, you're accumulating the uh, species number and the patches from the small, smallest patch to the largest patch and the bottom curve accumulates the species numbers and patch uh, and, and cumulative area from the largest patch to the second largest and third largest, et cetera. And as you can see, the small to large curve is above the large to small curve, which means that for any given amount of, of habitat, there are more species when that habitat is in several small patches than when it is in few large uh, patches, which in this case are the urban parks. Uh, the second one is uh, this study in Seoul, Korea of birds. Um, so this is, again, urban parks. And again, you can see that the several small uh, or the small to large curve is above the large to small curve. So again, there are more species of birds in these uh, urban parks in Seoul. Uh, when, uh, when you look at the, accum the cumulative area of, of several small patches, then uh, one, one or two or three uh, large ones for the same total area. Uh, here's the third one. This isn't uh, Quinn and Harrison curves, but it's a, just a different way of presenting the same information. So this is woodland specialist plant species in forest patches within Brussels in Belgium. So what they did is they, they did different combinations of patches, of two patches or three patches or four patches or five patches or six patches. Um, all of those com the combinations here add up to 40 hectares. Um, and what they found was that there are more species when you have that 40 hectares made up of um, five or six patches than when that 40 hectares is made up of two or three patches. So again, more species in several small than few large uh, forest patches. And then finally, uh, the fourth one is actually a study in Melbourne, Australia. Um, and this is a study of plant diversity in grassland patches within Melbourne. Um, there weren't any actual curves shown in the paper, but here is a quote from the paper that there was a greater number of small uh, that a greater number of smaller reserves contributed more species to the reserve system than fewer larger reserves covering the same area and this was true for all native species and also for uncommon species only so more species uh, plant species in several small and few large um, grassland patches Okay, and then finally, I'm just going to talk a little bit about work that um, some of my students have done in cities. Uh, so this is in cities, in a city, the city of Ottawa in Canada. And um, uh, we have studied, they have studied um, lichens, birds, bats, aquatic invertebrates, and aquatic uh, plants. These little symbols at the bottom represent different species. And so not not unexpectedly, the more um, natural area or at least green area that you have in the city, uh, the more species that you have of all these different uh, species groups. However, uh, we've looked at this uh, just for the birds and the bats, but if you consider all of the really small green spaces, so now we're talking about residential green spaces, so, so um, urban yards, backyards, front yards, if you add up all of those, all of the uh, species across um, those small, very small green spaces, and you compare that to the same total area of green space in larger green spaces, such as parks, you actually find as many species um, and sometimes more species uh, across, again, across the many small um, green spaces in the city. So to summarize everything that I've said, um, first of all, government and non-government agencies are, are often applying minimum patch size criteria um, such that um, habitat, patch, habitat patches that are smaller than whatever the minimum criterion is are not 
protected by um, policy or legislation. And uh, we have found that forest is more likely to be lost from small patches than large patches, possibly partly because of those policies, those minimum patch size criteria. Uh, however, um, research studies almost always find more species in several small than few large patches of the same total area. And this also applies to specialist species, threatened species, endangered species, and so on. Excuse me. Um, so what this means is that these minimum patch size criteria are actually doing a disservice to biodiversity conservation. And even in cities, studies find more species in several small than few large patches. So what that means is that all urban natural space contributes to biodiversity protection, no matter how small. Um, and so I guess this is what the councillor um, a few minutes ago was saying. Uh, this is what we're for, is, is habitat protection in general, irrespective of the sizes of the patches. They can be even as small as this little, this little patch in Paris. So that is my presentation. Thank you very much for listening. All right. Well, thank you very much, Lenore. Um, now, we have plenty of time for questions. So does anyone out there have a question for Lenore about her presentation? We've got uh, Kirsten Paris Lenore, who's a professor of urban ecology. Thanks, Lenore, for a fabulous presentation. I'm wondering why you think this myth has stuck so fast, just from one paper uh, presented in 1975 with a very simple idea. Why has it taken so long to overturn this myth? Uh, well, first, I wouldn't say it's actually completely overturned yet, <laughs> um, but um, uh, yeah, assuming that it's on its way to being overturned, um, I think there are a lot of reasons for that. One is that is that it has, uh, I didn't talk about this, I talked about it in the context of SLOSS, but the other um, kind of context for this whole discussion is in the context of the effects of habitat fragmentation. And um, so habitat fragmentation has typically been um, described as, uh, or at least implicitly described as the combination of the loss of habitat and the breaking apart of habitat. And so we know that the loss of habitat has negative effects um, on biodiversity, but uh, by combining these two things into one thing called fragmentation, then uh, you know fragmentation being the breaking apart of habitat. There's this idea that if you break habitat into a larger number of pieces, that that also has a negative effect because you're combining the effects of the loss of habitat, which has a strong negative effect, with the effects of the breaking apart of habitat. And so that has, I think. Um, hindered us for many years in terms of realizing that actually when you split these two things apart, the amount of habitat or the loss of habitat and the sort of breaking apart of habitat, you actually get opposite effects. That the, the, the subdivision of habitat into multiple patches controlling for or for a given amount of habitat uh, often has positive effects, or usually it has no effect, but often it has positive effects on various uh, species responses. So I think that has <clears throat> that's had a big effect on on uh, kind of maintaining this myth. Uh, and then at the same time, the word fragmentation itself just has a negative connotation uh in you know it's in in any kind of context um so that also has has sort of maintained the myth i think there are other uh reasons um for example i don't know about in australia but in canada um you know people people especially ecologists um want to go to large kind of uh, contiguous areas of nature um, you know, that's where you feel uh, connected, I guess, to nature. And um, one one thing that we like to do a lot is to go on canoe trips. And you for that, you actually need a large contiguous area, um, you know, hopping between little 
parks um, for your canoe trip isn't really going to cut it. So, so there may just be a gut feeling that it it's it has to be better to have the habitat all stuck together into a big block than to have it in a lot of small blocks, partly because it's what we value ourselves in terms of experiencing nature. Um, I mean, I'm going out on limb with that one, but you know, it's, that's a hypothesis for sure. Um, yeah, I, I guess that's, I guess that's what it is. I think there's also a certain amount of um, reluctance once we have uh, said something, you know, in the literature um, for a few decades, it's actually quite hard to then turn around and say, well, maybe we didn't get that quite right. Um, you know, there's a certain element of pride, I guess, involved as well. So I think there's a few, a few elements to it. Thanks, Lenore. Um, we've got a question down here from Jeff, I believe. Uh, Jeff Robinson from Oricon. Lenore absolutely loved your, your paper and such good news. I mean, I think some of us had kind of a feeling that when you look at the bits around the city and you see nature there that you kind of intuitively know that actually there must be something good happening in that space. But I suppose my question is, given that it's obviously a heck of a lot easier in a city to integrate lots of small patches of biodiversity than it is to go and say, well, let's go and put in a large park or garden or something like that. And I suppose my question is, if we were to look around at different cities of the, in the world who had understood that really well, and we're taking that information and sort of acting on it, what examples would you give or the ones you're familiar with? I'm not really an expert on that uh, um, in general, but I did, I showed that little picture of Paris partly because I know that um, they've had this, um, they've had a mayor in Paris for the last two terms who um, who's just really taken, in, taken on this greening the city and um and they just all all over the city there are, are now um little bits of green space where they um where they'll have like a little sign that's you know the greening of paris a project sort of and they have those insect hotels and and um and and they're just you know it, it can be like a, one tree it can be you know a, a little bit larger area so uh you know i think i think there is there are examples um, I read about another one recently, but I can't remember where it was. Um, but you know, one, one thing like, um, one, one reason it is actually can be less easy than it sounds, um, in cities is that the smallest green spaces are typically, uh, privately owned. So I don't like, again, I don't know about the situation in Australia, but it's pretty hard, um, in Canada to tell people what to do in their backyard. Um, so whether to whether to uh you know leave the trees and leave leave it as nat as you know natural as possible versus paving it over. Um, so so uh it may actually be sometimes more difficult in uh to to actually protect small spaces. Um, and I think that's also true, not just in cities, but in agricultural regions, at least around here, a lot of the small bits of natural uh, habitat are actually privately owned as opposed to owned by the uh, the province or the country. So um, so yeah, ownership is a big, uh, big issue in terms of um, putting this into play. But like I said before, on the other hand, the positive, on the positive note, there are a lot of people that care a lot about these small bits of, of nature um, in the city and um, and also in suburban and, and agricultural areas. And uh, and so, um, so yeah, I think that is actually an, uh, quite an optimistic, um, uh, you know, an optimistic aspect of this, that, that if we can just, uh, recognize that and encourage people to be able to uh to protect those areas and not suggest that they shouldn't be protected be because they're too small then i think we should uh, we should do that and, uh, i heard recently there's so there are there are things called land trusts which are sort of citizen groups that volunteer groups that get together and 
Uh, you can donate uh, properties to them and they protect them for nature. And um, I was just talking to someone uh, who is involved in a land trust near here, and they were saying that there's been a big increase in the number of people that want to donate properties to the land trust. So that's a positive, a positive sign. Thank you, Lenore. We we have something called Trust for Nature um, in okay. Australia, which is similar to that. So there might be a few people who have Trust for Nature properties in the room, actually. Um, do we have another question from the audience? Oh, there's a few going. Hi there. Thank you um, for the presentation. It was very interesting and definitely a space to think about compared to all the information I've heard um, growing up. So I had a question about additional information, oh, sorry, research in this space. So we're seeing more species in, com in smaller patches or a lot more smaller patches. Has there been research into the composition of those species makeup? So do we see more invasive species, more native or indigenous? So outside of the number of species, is there any information about that makeup? Yeah, so... Um... They're actually the the analyses that have been done um, actually suggest more rare species in several small than few large patches in when there is a difference, uh, which is also not what people were expecting, I would say. Um, and uh, and and I have I have in my reviews, I have I have sort of separated out the studies that specifically looked at specialist species or threatened species and the you get the same results for those groups of species i have a um, another another thing that um that people often um worry about with uh several small patches is that you have a lot of edge um and so they might be more susceptible to um, incursion by sort of generalist species and like you mentioned invasive I haven't seen any analyses of invasive species in this context um, but in terms of um, the sort of edge effects uh, I have an analysis that I haven't published yet but um, where I've, I've compared um, edge effects so this is on a species by species basis does it does the species have a negative edge effect so it's let it's more likely to be found in the in the interior of the habitat or a positive edge effect it's more likely to be found at the edge of the of the of the habitat and then for each of those species ask is is there any evidence for um whether it's more likely to be found in several small or a few large patches um so if you would you would predict um i mean all else being equal you would predict that if it's uh has a negative edge effect it would be more likely to be in a few large patches and if it has a positive edge effect it would be more likely to be in several small patches but there doesn't seem to be any real relationship between the two which actually surprised me quite a bit but i think that it's also i think it's related to that list of hypotheses that i uh, that I had that colorful list of hypotheses. There are a lot of mechanisms that can occur at the landscape scale. So, so uh, things to do with species interactions and and spreading uh, risk of of uh, disturbances and that kind of thing. And and so uh, taking a, a an observation at a local patch scale. So you know, edge to interior of a patch. And extrapolating that up to the effect over a landscape is probably not something we can do. Uh, it's certainly not something we can do without testing. Sorry, I probably went off topic a bit there, but no, thank you, Lenore. Um, I might ask our panel speakers to get ready. So, uh, yeah. Kirsten, Neil, and Adrian, if you would like to make your way up. Yeah, is there one more question? I've got a great question. I'm hoping there would be no questions so I could ask. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that's cool. Um, that was a really lovely talk. Thank you so much. Um, I was just wondering, in all the graphs you showed us, generally um, a plateau was reached in terms of the number of species uh, across that space. Um, is that something you'd suggest would be an end goal in urban ecology is to reach that plateau? Uh, or yeah, just always keep furthering. I mean, like I like I said, um, so the loss of habitat is 
is the most important um, cause, I guess, of biodiversity declines. And there are species that um, there are species that will will not not occur in an area unless there's a lot of habitat. So, for example, you know we won't have black bears in the city of Ottawa unless we have you know uh, let's probably sixty percent uh, forest in the city. So that's not going to happen. So we're we're if we're just looking at at the entire pool of mammals in this region, there are some mammals that we are never going to have in the city. Um, so I guess it depends on what, you know, the plateau is sort of, um, uh, there's like a, a, a pool, a, a, a notional pool, I guess, of species from which, you know, which could occur, I guess, in the city, given how the, the maximum amount of habitat that we're likely to ever have in the city, <laughs> let's put it that way. Um, and so that would be a valid I think that would, it would certainly be valid to to go for that that goal, and you would get you would get a very large proportion of the species. You could get a very large proportion of the species um, from that larger eco region. Um, you know, if 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 we really, you know, if we really put our minds to protecting the green spaces, I think. All right, thank you. And thank you everyone for your questions. We're going to move to our panel discussion now. So I would like to invite um, Neil and Adrian and Kirsten up on stage. Uh, now, Professor Kirsten Paris is a Professor of Urban Ecology at the University of Melbourne. Um, we have Neil Marshall, Neil McCarthy. Sorry, Neil. Um, you're the Executive Director of Mosaic Insights. And we have Adrian Marshall, um, who's facilitator of the Grassy Plains Network and has done a lot of research on, on Melbourne's grasslands. Um, now, Kirsten has published a lot about urban ecology. And uh, I'll shortly just ask you for your general thoughts about Lenore's uh, presentation. But in particular, I'm interested, Kirsten, because you've published a paper about existing ecological theories and how they apply to urban environments. So I'm pretty keen to hear your perspective on the sloss debate in an urban area. Um, I'll just, and Neil, um, you have been the CEO of World Parks. You've been the CEO of the North East Catchment Management Authority and the General Manager of Parks in uh, Victoria, and you've been involved in healthy parts, healthy people. So I'm I'm quite interested about your perceptions of um, how these sort of ecological theories, how we see them in environments like urban areas or parks out there, but how it can sink into policy and strategies effectively. Um, and Adrian, you've published a lot on the value of verges, small green spaces uh, in front of people's houses. So I, I'm pretty interested in your perceptions there about sloths in cities uh, to do with grasslands and, and lawns. So we might kick it out off with uh, Professor Kirsten Paris. Thanks, Kirsten. Thanks very much, Freya. Uh, thanks again, Lenora, for a wonderful presentation. And so amazing to see so many people here. Um, everyone uh, is here for urban nature and that's something I applaud. Uh, so in terms of ecological theories that apply in urban environments, many of them do, but I've not ever been a fan of the single large idea. And uh, another paper uh, that I was part of led by Kylie Soans and some other folks from our research group at Melbourne uh, was trying to debunk some of these um, myths in urban ecology. And I remember back in 2009 when the Melbourne Strategic Assessment um, was put forward. Uh, this is the document uh, and the assessment that allowed the expansion of Melbourne's urban growth boundaries by 40,000 hectares. Uh, the modelling that was under that underpinned that work, uh, modelling of different threatened species, had within it that assumption that even if this patch of habitat was suitable for our tiny species that only moved 10 metres in its lifetime, if that patch of habitat was less than 10 hectares or 100, it had no value and it was immediately wiped out of consideration. And uh, so that idea of the minimum patch size has really impacted negatively 
the biodiversity, the threatened species and threatened ecological communities of Melbourne. And Adrian will be very familiar with his, with his work on grasslands as well. And it's something we absolutely have to overturn uh, because in my work, I've found tiny spaces can do amazing things for frogs, for insects, for plants, uh, pretty much all the groups we've looked at. Well, Adrian, thank you, Kirsten. This is on. Um, there's just a this little one. On. Yeah, so what yes. are your thoughts? Okay, that's good. Um, yeah, so I'm the facilitator of the Grassy Plains Network, so I spend a lot of time advocating for grasslands, and what Kirsten has been saying about the Melbourne Strategic Assessment is absolutely right. There was that minimum built in there, and it's an ongoing thing uh, for, for us. I, the VCAT tribunals I've been at and so on, the argument is always this is too small to be worth um, considering. So it, it's baked into the whole development um, mentality, I suppose. Our planning scheme has it built into, like you can clear uh, vegetation up to, I think it's 1,400 square metres. I can't remember the exact figure. Uh, Lincoln at the back will con correct me, I'm sure. Um, but the, um, yeah, without any, with any regard to the, um, you don't have to get seek permission and so on. So uh, it's also, I think, um, a matter, there's this idea of management ease that's built into this small versus large um, conception. So uh, it's much easier to manage, they say, one large reserve rather than 20 small reserves. So we've actually found the exact opposite with the Western Grassland Reserve, which is that mass aggregation of um, the from the Melbourne Strategic Assessment, when we got rid of so many of our small patches, we went and used the money to buy one large patch, the Western Grassland Reserve, and that is a management nightmare that is taking so many resources and so on that, um, yeah, it, it's, it, it wasn't a win at all, let's just say. Um, the other thing, thank you, Kelly. The other thing um, is that uh, small patches you can, um, provide a lot more care for. So you've got a, a symbolic level to all of this, not just an ecological function level. Like the, the idea of like, um, there's a, a uh, artwork out in Hobson's Bay, it's called Lost Land Found. It's by a uh, Bunyurong artist. And it's just like a three meter by three meter patch of grassland in the middle, constructed grassland in the middle of a heritage park. And it is uh, really profound in its significance. And that, profundity is because it is such a small patch in such a large urbanized area. So um, yeah, there, there's all sorts of great stuff going on. I suppose small patches we know kick um, punch above their weight too, like the city of Ur Melbourne's urban forest is the greatest example of it, where you've got like these tiny little nature strips and they've all got a great whopping tree in them that's doing an amazing amount of work and so on. and. Yeah, there are just like hundreds of these tiny little things, but they're doing a huge amount of work. So aggregated together, they really do far more than a large park with a lot of lawn in it and just a few trees. Yeah. Thanks, Adrian. Neil, what is your perspective on sloths in urban areas? Uh, yeah, well, I'm probably going to end up saying a lot because uh, I've got a lot of perspectives about things, but given, given that you've pretty well opened up the Pandora's box on myth busting and which is fantastic because uh, a lot of us in this room have a lot of responsibility for creating a lot of those myths you know the academic research stuff has actually generated the data that we've built myths upon and that World Conservation 1980 document I actually lived with that was what I learned and therefore that's what I argued for and I used to argue that we shouldn't have grasslands and Royal Park, and we probably shouldn't actually, you know, have fragmentation of grasslands in the west of Melbourne. But you start to realise that a lot of those things are really fundamentally wrong because we've created these constructs, but the policy responsibility is even greater. So the academics have got to keep generating all this information, but the policy setting needs to actually be the area that we need to challenge. Because we create create these myths. In fact, we create all the myths that we're trying to fight 
against. And I've spent probably the last 30 odd years challenging those sort of policy myths, both at the state, national and international level. And I'll just touch upon two. One is healthy parks, healthy people. Uh, about 24 years ago, I was told by the state government to actually dump it as a concept that we should be considering of connecting people to nature. Because, you know, from a policy perspective, what did we have to do with health? The fact is, you know, you go, well, traditional owners lived on the country. They actually understood the connection with country and therefore their well-being. Why isn't it the same for everyone else? That took a long time to change. But internationally, and we're still fighting it, but the IUCN, which I'm involved in quite heavily, the Nature for All program, uh, the ICLE, you know, uh, Cities with Nature program that Cathy somewhere around in the room has been heavily involved in. They're the policy changes that we've been trying to drive. That's taken a long time to change that. But the other one, which really does relate to this thing about habitat fragmentation, what it means in cities, is the National Park City concept. I've been involved in that for well, it's about 10 years since we started arguing a case for a different approach to actually the concept of conservation in cities. And uh, we've been working heavily with the IUCN. We've actually gone up against all these myths that I was trained in in the IUCN to actually start that dialogue to think differently. And that's where we, as we open up this box, we all need to actually accept what's gone in the past, but realise that might not be right. And even what we might accept today when we leave, keep asking the question, what if, A, they're not totally right? What if we can do it differently? What if, you know, the whole concept of habitat could be thrown on its head? And this is my final point, which because that's why I want to get into the detail. Most of you are probably thinking about habitat in a traditional natural form. You know, it's got to have a whole range of plant species in a certain structure, et cetera. We've actually got to broaden our horizons in city to actually accept the built form is part of that habitat structure. Therefore, everything matters and therefore where a small patch sits in someone's you know front garden whatever you know and their house is actually part of that habitat structure because you know when you look at some of the facts about like take peregrine falcons guess where a lot of the great brooding pairs of peregrine falcons are in the world i happen to be in cities not in national parks and we've actually got to understand that differently you know they adapt, we're not adapting. Thank you. Um, now, I'd like to just ask a final question and get and ask each of you to respond. And it's um, about what you were just talking about. Also, Lenore mentioned when she was talking about people's backyards. And one of the striking things in cities that we always talk about in our team is there's a potential for a whole lot of people to care a whole lot about nature if they can hook into it and know about it and see it. Um, Kirsten, you've just had a paper out called The Value of Question First Citizen Science in Urban Ecology as well, which I think gets to this, having a more community-led, publicly engaged driver to get people to appreciate nature. I also know, um, Adrian, you know, I'm a plant ecologist, I bloody love grasslands, but lots of people think they look like paddocks and pretty boring, especially at some times of year. So there's you know, an effort to get people to notice grasslands and protect our endangered grasslands. And I think you hinted at all of this as well, Neil, about getting people on board. So I just wouldn't mind hearing your reflections on, um, I guess, the value of people in cities and protecting our small bits of, of urban nature. Thanks, Freya. I think that so many people in cities really appreciate small pieces of nature. Uh, and I've found that through you know, community groups I've been involved with, as well as uh, the students I teach and the people I meet. And the work we've done um, in citizen science has been 
uh, a way to engage people with different groups of animals. So we, we set up an app that um, allowed people to survey frogs, beneficial insects, uh, flying foxes, so our fruit bats, and um, also possums and gliders in cities all around Australia and had uh, really interesting um, interactions with people who have just come to love each of those groups of animals and through that connection feel connected more broadly to all sorts of nature in the city. So I think uh, engaging with people and then allowing them to see what's right near them uh, is really very important um, for cities all around Australia. Thank you. Adrian, final thoughts? Yes, well, um, grasslands, they're not a very charismatic ecosystem, I suppose. Most people do think of them as brown, weedy, snake-infested fire traps. But uh, most of the time, like when I lead a um, tour to a grassland or whatever, it's to get people into the grassland because as soon as you do that, and you get people to look down, you know, it's like snorkeling, you can't see anything. And then you look under the water with your mask on and suddenly there's a whole world there and you see all the biodiversity between the tussocks and so on, which is where most of the biodiversity is, it's not the grasses. But so getting people in there, and it's the only way that uh, for me, you can really build um, stakeholder engagement, those stewards that are gonna look after grasslands into the future and so on um, to change the perception of them. The other thing I'd say is it's also all about context as well. So you have to like design the city around the grassland in such a way that people can get to it, can want to engage with it. And um, that will also do the grassland some good. So like with, with your ground and grass rods, for instance, you don't want a sports stadium or a freeway with 24 hour lights and sound next to your ground and grass rod reserve because it's just pointless, you know, it's, it decreases the value of it. So I think we have to look at our whole urban environment in terms of like how we can um, increase the engagement of people and the um, and to treat the, the creatures in there with as much respect as possible. Yeah. Thank you, Adrian. Neil, final thoughts? Yeah, yeah my, my final thought, which is probably been sort of uh, reinforced by when we start to talk, you know, I've done this myself in terms of grasslands that you know everyone just thinks they're yeah, they're weedy and and you know got no value etc. But that is an urban myth, and I think we should sort of take a bit of stock and actually see if we can, even though we're talking about urban myths today, actually stop ourselves talking about those urban myths because we actually reinforce them. Every time we think of, yeah, you know, people don't like it because it's, you know, a grassland and it's full of snakes and, you know, it, it's not sexy type stuff. It is, and it is actually what we have and, and therefore we should be thinking about it in that different sort of way. And I think that's that big takeout message that I've got. Try not to keep repeating the urban myths because I suspect we've created them and we love reinforcing them, but it's actually what we're fighting against. Yeah. Thank you. Now, Lenora is still with us, and I believe she has a final thought as well. I just wanted to say thank you again. Um, it's I've really enjoyed listening to the panel. It's made me quite hopeful, actually. And, um, and yeah, so I wish I could teleport myself over there. Um, it looks like a fantastic meeting, but yeah, just thanks again for inviting me for the discussion. Well, thank you very much for presenting, Lenore. I think we all very much appreciate it. I know there are lots of urban ecologists and road ecologists in the room, so I'm sure everyone has a million more questions for you, but maybe one day we can all uh, get together in person. So thank you very, very much. Um, I'd also sincerely like to thank Kirsten, Adrian and Neil for your time.